Good morning, again. Uh, our, our first reading, uh, this, this was entirely coincidental. I was uh, looking for a poem that felt like it went, went with uh, the way I was thinking this week. And I, I landed on a poem by James Cruz, who is a wonderfully gentle-spirited poet uh, who, who wrote what I think is one of the, the, the best coming out poems about his experience as a young man coming out. Uh, and, I, and I thought, uh, it seemed familiar, like I'd read it in this space before, and I looked in my notes and discovered that on this Sunday last year, I read this same poem. So I, I guess this is a second Sunday of March poem. Um, this is James Cruz telling my father. It's a poem about being seen unexpectedly. Telling my father. I found him on the porch that morning, sipping cold coffee, watching a crow dip down from the power line into the pile of black bags stuffed in the dumpster where he pecked and snagged a can tab, then carried it off, clamped in his beak, like the key to a room only he knew about. My father turned to me then, taking in the reek of my smoke, traces of last night's eyeliner I decided not to wipe off this time. Out late, was all he said, and then smiled, rubbing the small of my back through the robe for a while before heading inside, letting the storm door click softly shut behind him. Later, when I stepped into the kitchen again, I saw it waiting there on the table, a glass of orange juice he had poured for me and left sweating in a patch of sunlight so bright I couldn't touch it at first. There's a terrible, terrible joke that I first learned from my friend Nate that asks, where does a mansplainer get water? From a well, actually. Sorry. Sorry, nobody even got that. Well, actually, it's kind of the, the, the thing, you know, when a, when a woman says something and a man says to her, well, actually, okay, it's, the joke is dead when you have to explain it. It's just, what, I'm, just I'm done, I don't know. All right, anyway. I'm sorry, I, I told you it was terrible, so it, it lived up to that. Um, be, in, in today's assigned Bible reading, Jesus ambles up to a watering hole and has his longest conversation with any one person uh, in any of the Gospels. It, it goes like this. So it's, it's a long reading. It's from John chapter 4. Jesus came to a Samaritan city. Oh, hey, hey Maisie, just in case you're interested, I'll be right back. <laughs> in case you're interested, there's, there's a children's bulletin that goes, goes with today's material. If if you want to do anything with it. You don't have to. This is how the story goes from John chapter 4. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the place Jacob had given his, to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon, so hot. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, uh, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how can you be asking me for a drink? She said this because the Judeans and Samaritans did not share things among themselves. Jesus answered her, if you only knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. This means water that's running instead of kind of stagnant still water. And the woman said to him, sir, or that's what she thought he was saying at least. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it with his daughters and sons and flocks? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty the water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming back here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband. 
Jesus said to her, you're right to say that, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said, ah, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped at this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, believe me, the hour is coming when you're not going to worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know, for salvation comes from the Judeans. But the hour is coming. It's now here when true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth. That's the kind of worship that God wants. God is spirit. And those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he'll proclaim all these things to us. Jesus said, I'm the one. The one who's speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with this woman. No one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and went on their way to him. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I'd ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days, and many believed because of his word. It's the word of God. Thanks be to God. What sustains your life? What props you up? What keeps you going when you feel like you're just about to crash? What thread did you hold on to and tie around your waist to pull yourself through these last three years? What fills you up when you're feeling empty? These are some of the questions we'll just have in the background today. First, I want to talk about this very long Bible reading. Maybe you've heard this story before, Jesus and the Samaritan woman, or maybe this morning is the first time. Uh, maybe you remember all of the details from a lifetime of church going, or maybe you're pretty sure you hear it about every three years when it comes around again, and then it fades into the background. Uh, whatever the case, I wonder, what jumps out at you? What do you notice the most from this story? And people in here, can, you can call things out. People online, you can unmute and call things out if you want. What jumps out at you from this story? You didn't know it's going to be participatory. <laughs> pushback. Pushback. Okay, the pushback. All right. Anyone else? It does, yeah, it does. It focuses on a woman, um, which, which is, a, and, a, and a woman who's, again, with the pushback, not, not afraid to jump into deep conversation. Bold, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, it feels like a trap at some level. And that, and that, that the being married, having been married five times, and now you're not married. I, I knew all this. I, aha, you're a prophet. Yes, that's the, that's the thing. That was, y'all, good, good job on y'all for not making that be the first thing that you mentioned. Because my hunch is that in a lot of churches, when they hear this story, that's the thing that jumps up to them the most. Um, so, yes, my guess was that this woman's, and let me just stop for a moment and notice that the gospel writer does not even give her a name, so maybe we can call her Sam, short for Samaritan. Um, my hunch was that Sam's marital history was going to be one of the things that rolls up as the key details of the story. Uh, certainly a lot of ministers have preached sermons about that uh, and that have made a lot out of that fact. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that a lot of those ha uh, sermons have been preached by men who haven't noticed that the gospel writer doesn't give Sam a name. We, and I'm, I mean broadly, uh, this, the broadest sense of we in this country, we love the salacious details. That is why, if Google is telling me the truth, 
The Bachelorette is in its 19th season, and why there are so many Real Housewives shows. <laughs> the, the Real Housewives of y'all are a hot mess. <laughs> That's right. um, people eat that stuff up, but we should know that our cultural mores are not the same as those of the ancient Near East. There's no real dive in the story into Sam's many marriages, uh, though we should know that her social power would have been very limited. The odds are that she was very unlucky. But neither Jesus nor the storyteller seem to be all that interested. There's nothing in Jesus' response that, expects, that, uh, that suggests moralism. Instead, this detail seems to be mostly important because it allowed him to show that he was the kind of person who could look at someone and truly see them. Aha, you're a prophet, she said. But I wonder about a different detail of the story. What's the setting? Where did it take place? Does anybody remember that? At a well, actually. <laughs> in the middle of the hottest part of the day. Thank you. Yes, a well in the hottest part of the day. And not just any well, Jacob's well. That's probably a detail that would have jumped out at the earliest readers and hearers of this story because it had echoes of a lot of important older stories, stories that Judeans and Samaritans held in common with each other. And maybe that's an important footnote. The Gospel of John uses the language, if you're reading in straight translation, the language of Jews and Samaritans as if they were different religious groups. Um, and that's how they understood each other, for sure. The Bible scholar Wilda Gaffney makes the point that the terms are better understood regionally, which is why she opts for Judeans and Samaritans in her translation. The boundary that Jesus crossed, he went into a Samaritan city. Um, it was not only geographic, but it was an ethnic and religious boundary that was several centuries old. I'm not going to bog you down in the details here, but just as a reminder, in 722 BCE, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, was invaded by the, the Assyrian Empire, and a lot of the population was deported, carried off to live elsewhere in exile, but not the whole population. The empire then imported some other people into the region, and those people made their lives there. They, they married some of the Israelite people who had been left behind. They absorbed the local religious culture. They also brought new traits to it. Tensions between the two groups arose a couple of centuries later when the Persian Empire let the heirs of those deportees come back into Israel. Judeans and Samaritans were both groups of Jewish people who had different understandings of Judaism, but they shared among them some foundational stories that make up the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those stories included how the patriarch Abraham sent a servant out to find a wife for his son Isaac. That servant spotted Isaac's soon-to-be wife, Rebecca at the community well. Those stories included Isaac and Rebekah's son, Jacob, uh, the Jacob of Jacob's well in the story, first encountering his wife, Rachel, at a well. Those stories included Moses, first meeting his wife, Zipporah, at, you guessed it, a well. Wells were the tinder of the ancient world. And so all of those first readers and first hearers were wondering when they saw this, is Jesus going to swipe right or swipe left? I, I, sh I shouldn't use those terms when I'm not 100% confident what they mean. <laughs> but the point is this. Jesus, on his own, at a well where he finds a woman on her own, it's in the midday heat, he asks her for a drink, Everything about this story says something really important is about to happen, so we should pay attention. 
And what happens is a discussion that brings two people together across boundaries of territory, ethnicity, gender, and sect. It starts with the recognition of a basic human need. Can you get me a drink, please? I like to imagine Jesus was uh, more polite than it comes across in the story. Can you get me a drink, please? They're both at a well in the middle of the day. He has nothing to lower into it. Hydration is essential. They share this common human need between them, and Jesus asks her to help him meet it. That moment of a shared basic need, a shared humanity between them, leads to a discussion about a deeper need. Once the thirst of your body is quenched, what fills the thirst of your soul? This is the point at which the detail about Sam's relationship status comes out. And again, I don't want to make too big a deal out of it. The fact of five husbands very well could have meant that she married five brothers in succession, each of whom died. That was one of the marital constructs of the ancient Near East, right? We're glad that maybe we, things don't work the same for us these days. The story doesn't linger there. She's, she is coy with this intense stranger, guarded. She doesn't want to say too much. But he looks at her and sees her, not as a stranger, not as a project, not as a distraction to help him while away the time while his friends go find food. He truly sees her, Sam. And that's where the story turns. It does seem striking that she was at the well alone. From what I understand, drawing water would have typically been a social task, something that women did in groups together. Maybe the other women of her village found her too intense. Maybe she was a big ball of grief and other people didn't know how to be with her, how to respond. Maybe they thought she was unlucky and they wanted to keep their distance so that bad luck didn't rub off on them. Or maybe I'm wrong about all of this and it's incidental. That's always a live option. But it seems important to me that she was there alone and that Jesus saw her so clearly and that then she went running back off home to tell other people about this clear-eyed stranger and that the people came back with her clearly influenced by her story, which says maybe that that's when her deep thirst was met. When we first met her, she's on her own. When the story ends, she's woven back into community. What's your deep thirst? In 1938, researchers at Harvard University started the Harvard Study of Adult Development. It's still going on, probably not led by the same researchers. Just a hunch. <laughs> um, it's the longest study of human life that has ever been undertaken. One of the things that they study is human happiness. And one of the keys that they've isolated for human happiness is relationships. According to the study, ongoing loneliness raises a person's odds of dying in a given year by 26%. That's, that's pretty high. That's a sobering statistic to consider on this Sunday that marks three years to the Sunday from the time when things shut down for a pandemic. This Sunday in 2020 was the first time we ever held church on Zoom. We got Priscilla helped make the call on that. Um, I remember Joy told us how relieved she was by that. Little did we know how long it was going to last, right? There were definitely some gifts that came about because of that. Hi, virtual worshipers. We're so glad that you are with us. Oh, look at them waving at us. See it? See, it's great. Definite gifts to this. But it also imposed steep, steep costs. Loneliness being one of them. Those Harvard researchers now argue 
that we should pay as much attention to our social fitness as we do to our physical fitness. How do we spend our time and with whom do we spend it? The researchers report, uh, they say that repeatedly when the participants of our study reached old age, they would make a point to say that what they treasured most were their relationships. When we come down to it, that's what this story is, a story of relationship, of discovering interdependence, of co-flourishing. Jesus needed a drink. Sam needed a friend. And out of that, a community was strengthened. So maybe that can be our question for the day as we think about our community Lent tree for the, for the season or a series of questions. You can choose from one or more of these, I suppose, <laughs> if you want to add a leaf to our tree while when we get to the offertory period. Um, again, those leaves are on your, on your pews. Um, what are you thirsty for? Who helps quench that thirst? Who truly sees you? And what do you need them to see? These people and you are God's good news. Amen.